Thanks can mean more than a person might imagine. There are a lot of people in prisons of life and what they really would like to be is remembered in their difficult times, in their moments, in their hardships, their heartaches. We're going to the book of Genesis this morning, and in the book of Genesis, we're going to find a little more information about the life of Joseph, and today we're going to be talking about, remember, remember, the life of Joseph. You know, last Sunday, we talked about the life of Joseph and the fact that he was a man with a dream, and you know, uh, many people think those dreams that he had actually got him into trouble, but uh, you know, if so, then they also have to realize it was the dreams that got him out of trouble. But uh, more than that, God had a plan for Joseph's life, and Joseph's life was unfolding down a pathway that to him was not very predictable, but it was predictable to God. You know, God knows what he's doing. God really does have a plan. And then this past Wednesday evening, we talked again about the life of Joseph and the motivations. He interacted with a lot of people. Some people that he interacted with were motivated by hatred. Some people were motivated by anger. Some people motivated by lust. Some people were motivated by money. There are a lot of motivations. Some people in Joseph's life were motivated by that group courage. You know the courage you get when you're in a group? Y'all, know, y'all, y'all all know that courage. It, it's a courage you get when you're in a group that you do not have by yourself. Uh, you know, what, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you know, most likely in a group uh, this morning you sang. Anybody want to stand up and sing by themselves? Okay, you know, group courage goes away whenever you're all by yourself sometimes. And uh, uh, that uh, Joseph's brothers were motivated by all of them conspiring and talking about what they wanted to do to him. And, uh, you know, there are different motivations. Uh, We found out this past uh, um, um, Wednesday. But the motivation that Joseph had was the proper motivation. Joseph was motivated by simply deciding that he was going to do what was right. He was going to do what God wanted him to. He was going to do what was right even though he had been done wrong. And so we made a commitment, those of us who were here on Wednesday evening, we decided that we too were going to try to put that into our life, into practice in our life, that we were just going to hold a standard, that we were going to do what was right even if we were done wrong. And, you know, I I trust uh, not too many of you have had tests this week in those arenas of life. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of motivations. Be motivated to do what is right in the eyes of God, even if someone else is not. This morning we're talking about remember. But by the time we get to Genesis chapter 40, by the way, that's where we're going in the event you want to get there ahead of us. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 40, Joseph has already been wrongfully accused Spitefully accused. He's been, you know, uh, uh, put into prison and un- unjustly incarcerated, and yet here he still has a good attitude. By this time, he has already become the chief jailer's trustee. He's in charge of everything. In fact, chapter 39 says that whatever the prisoners did was because Joseph let them do it. Joseph, uh, the, 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 the jailer, did not even look at anything that was under Joseph's authority. He put everything under Joseph's authority. And so Joseph, you know, he, he really was doing good even though he was in prison, just like he had been in Potiphar's house, just like he had been in his dad's house. He was, you know, at the top of his game. He was doing good. And when you interacted with him, you might not even know you were interacting with a prisoner. You would thought you were, you know, you were interacting with someone who had all the authority. He had the keys in his hand. He could do anything thing he wanted to and the prisoners could do anything that he allowed them to do that's an amazing place to be in a jail and uh, especially when you're you're you know honest <laughs> you know uh, uh, Genesis chapter 40 have you found it yet let's begin reading in, in verse number one and then I'm going to skim through this uh, because there's like 23 verses and we'll never get them all read if uh, you know you'll 
I know what happens. Whenever you read too many verses, most people think, oh, that's time to sleep. Oh, I like that. Uh, there, there was, a, there was a, a sign someone sent me the other day about a billboard that said, uh, you know, attend church here. You know, it was on the church signs. Short sermons, it said something. You know, uh, and, and I, I, I uh, sent them back a, a uh, or, or they sent it to me on Facebook, I think, or whatever. I sent them back, no, it was text. I sent them back a text and said, mm, I don't like short sermons. I like longer naps. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to preach long enough for you to get a good one, okay? Uh, all right. Are you ready? Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. It came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Now, Pharaoh's called a king. He's also called Pharaoh. It's the same guy, okay? So here, these two officers of the court of Pharaoh, this king of Egypt, they had offended the king. Verse 2 says, and Pharaoh was angry with them. I mean, he was so angry with his butler and his baker that verse 3 says he put them in custody. He put them into the same jail, the same prison where Joseph was imprisoned. Verse 4 says that... that uh, the captain of the guard, he charged Joseph. That means that Joseph was over them, okay? But you notice what it says? That Joseph served them. He served them, and they were in custody for some time, for a while, for a long while. Other translations say for a good season. They were in, in, in there for a while. But Joseph, even though he was in charge, isn't that interesting? He served them. Verse 5 says that while they were confined there in that prison, that both of these men dreamed dreams. Each man had his own dream. Verse 6, the Bible says that Joseph, he came into them one morning, and when he looked at them, he saw that they were sad. He just looked and he, you know, he, he took notice that they, they, they were very, very sad. And so... Uh, uh, verse 7, so he asked this butler and this baker, uh, he said, why do you look so sad today? Why, you know, I mean, here Joseph is stopping by. He's busy. He's in charge of all the jails. And on top of that, he's wrongfully imprisoned. He's been spitefully accused. He's been wrongly uh, placed in this incarceration. He's even been, you know, a, a, a slave. He's, he's from another country, but yet... He stops by and says to these guys, why are you so sad? Verse 8 says, and they told him that we each had a dream. And there's no one to tell us what this dream is about. So Joseph said to them, you know, hey, God's the one that interprets dreams. Joseph said, tell me your dream. Please. Please. That's... You know, and an extra encouragement. You see, he's really wanting. Joseph wants to hear the dream. Please confide in me. Please share with me your burden. Please, why are you so sad? Oh, you know, you know tell me more. Please. Then, verse 9 says, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and the dream goes like this, verse 9 and 10 tell us, that, the, that uh, you know, this butler dreamed that there was a vine that grew up and it, it produced a, a cluster of grapes and he took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup and he put the cup into Pharaoh's hand and, and uh, you know, uh, there was, it was three different branches that, that, that grew up. And so Joseph tells him in, in verse 12, he says, Joseph says, well, here's what this means. You know, the three branches are three days. Verse 13, he says, and within three days, Pharaoh is going to restore you. He's going to restore you to your position, and you're going to serve him like you did before. Everything's going to be okay in three days. Verse 14, Joseph says this, but remember me. Everything's going to be okay. God's going to bless you. God's going to help you, you know. Uh, but when it happens, remember me. When everything's okay with you, remember me. Show me some kindness. 
You know, I've been showing you kindness for the whole time you've been here. I've been serving you. Show me some kindness and help me to get out of this prison, out of this house. Verse 15, this is the only time that Joseph really ever complains during his whole stint and during his whole 93 years in Egypt. He says, uh, I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews and I've done nothing. I should not be in this prison. I should not be in this dungeon. Well, verse 16 says that when the chief baker saw that the interpretation for the butler was a good interpretation, you know, when, when I mean, when, when people are handing out good prophecies, everybody wants to get in line. <laughs> and that's what he did. Man, it went good. Oh, great. Hey, this guy gives out some good prophecies. All right. I think I'll get in line. He said, Joseph, hey, you know, I was also in my dream. I, you know, my dream was about me. I was, you know, I, I, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, there were three baskets on my head. And, and, and uh, verse 17 says, and, and on the top of the basket, there was all kinds of baked goods and the birds were coming and eating out of it. Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me what's going to happen, you know. So... Joseph said, hey, the three baskets are three days as well. Verse 19, he said, within three days, Pharaoh will hang you on a tree. He's going to bring you before him, and he's going to hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat your flesh from you. Verse 20 says, now it came to pass on the third day, it was Pharaoh's birthday. He made a feast for all his servants, and he lifted up the head. He, he, he brought the chief butler and the chief baker among his servants. He brought them up and introduced them and you know, brought them back into his court. And verse 21 says that he restored the chief butler. Verse 22 says he hanged the chief baker, just like Joseph had interpreted. Verse 23 says... Yet the chief butler, the guy that was restored to his position, the chief butler did not remember Joseph. The one thing Joseph asked, the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. Wow. As we go through this account, especially learning from Joseph, you know, um, as you may remember, Joseph is introduced in chapter 30 of the book of Genesis. And uh, through the book, the rest of the book, all the way to chapter 50, we find Joseph's life unfolding. Well, it tells us a little bit in that passage about Judah and about some others. But, but you know, God introduced Joseph. And for 40% of the book of Genesis occurs during the life of Joseph. Joseph is a very important figure because Joseph shows us the continuing covenant. We all know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, well, you know, were the covenant partners of God. I mean, I mean, I, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But you, like me, most likely feel like you would fall outside of that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob phenomenon. I mean, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, powerful. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the covenant. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the things that God did through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to set us up. But what happens after well, Joseph is a picture of what happens after God establishes that covenant in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because then the covenant is being lived. And it's being lived in very difficult times. It's being lived in a foreign land. It's being lived under various circumstances. And we get to watch Joseph live the convictions of the covenant among a people and in a world where God is not known and God is not appreciated. A whole lot of Joseph's life gives us encouragement as to how to live our life. And I believe that God reveals so much through the life of Joseph that if we were to take his life and study it, and, and try to get to understand it, that we can find ourselves at most moments in our life somewhere in that picture. And we can see how 
to take ourselves from the place where we may be to the place where God would like to bring us. In watching Joseph in this particular moment, we learn so many things. You notice that Joseph, even though he was imprisoned wrongfully, yet he really did well in prison. You notice as well in this account that he served the prisoners. I mean, even, even though he was, you know, put in there under very difficult circumstances, he had the proper attitude. He decided he was going to do what was right, even though he'd been done wrong. He was going to give God the greatest chance to bless him, even in the midst of a very difficult situation. Joseph even gave time. He, he cared about others, and he, he stopped. You know, nothing says I care like time. He sat down and listened to you know, the dreams, listened to what was making these two men sad. He sat down and listened to them. He, he gave them his best advice. He was not uh, afraid. He was bold enough to speak to them what he believed the will of God was. He gave them you know, good counsel, and, you know, uh, um, but Joseph was forgotten. There was no thank you. There was nothing. He was just forgotten. How in the world can we take this story and apply it to our lives today? What can we learn that, so that when we leave here today, like Wednesday evening, like Sunday, that we have something that we can take home with us from the Word, something that we can give to others during our week? What can we learn from this account in Genesis 40 today? What can we apply to our lives? Well, number one, one of the first things that speaks to me in this situation is that Joseph learned something. This is what it's taught me. Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. <laughs> you know, you don't always get to decide what you're going to go through, but you do decide how you're going to go through it. You don't always get to decide where you're going to be planted. You don't always get to decide the situations that you're facing, but you do decide how you're going to go through these situations. Whether they're fair or they're unfair, it's not what you're going through, but what you're going to that matters most. And we have to keep our focus on all that God has for us, on the dream that he gave us, on the motivation of our heart to do what's right even when we've been done wrong, and yet make sure that we do our very best wherever we find ourselves. You see, you also need to realize what Joseph realized. We need to realize that we are not the only people going through a difficult moment. When we go through difficult moments, we need to really realize we're not the only people facing problems. You know, Joseph was facing a problem, but you know, there were people all around. He was surrounded by people. By prisoners, every one of them had a story. Every one of them had a problem. Every one of them was facing trouble. Every one of them, you know, uh, were going through things. And Joseph, no doubt, had a habit. Just because he was going through difficult times, he had a habit of realizing he was not the only person going through these times. It helps to create perspective. And as I said, this is no doubt what gave him the impetus to stop and care about, you know, what's going on in your day? Why are you so sad? It was refreshing, no doubt, to these men that Joseph took time. He was the busiest guy in the prison. He was over everything. Nothing happened without his okay. But he sat down and listened to them. You know, people will care what you know when they know that you care. And one of the greatest ways out of a problem is to do well in your problem. Many times we need to realize what we need first is victory in our situation before we necessarily gain victory over our situation. Sometimes it takes time to gain victory over the situation. But we need victory in our lives. Joseph evidently had found victory in his life. Evidently, he learned to bloom where he was planted, wherever that was. He was not in control of having been placed in prison, but he was in control of what he was going to do since he was there. And believe you me, it will always help you to help others. And that's what he was busy doing. 
serving. It will always help us when we help others, especially when we're going through difficult times. This is what the end of the book of Job reveals, is that when Job prayed for his friends, the Lord turned his captivity. That's what the Bible says. And God restored to him because he cared about someone else. Job had lost everything. It was a horrible, horrible time for him. But yet, whenever he helped someone else, God helped him. It will help us to help others, and we need to learn to bloom wherever we're planted. Okay? A second thing that this particular story, this account of Joseph's life reveals to me, a second thing that we probably need to embrace this morning is that not every word of God will be found in a promise book. Now, don't shoot me down and don't, don't uh, start disbelieving, okay? We need to make sure we have balance in our life. Not every word from God is going to be yes. You know, God is capable of saying no. No or yes. <laughs> Not every word that we get from God is going to be, yeah, have it your way. Yeah, do whatever you want to, do it your way, and, and oh, no worries, I'll pay for it all. That's not everything that God has to say. And if we do not embrace a God that has a right and at times reasons that we may not understand, but God that has a right to say no or even not now, then, then we may not know God in the depth that our life requires or that our joy requires or that our patience or our faith or our confidence in him, our trust in him requires. It's so important to realize this. And this is what we learn. You know, the butler got a good word from, from God, but the baker didn't. You know? The baker did not get this all polished. Hey, everything's going to be okay, buddy. I'm certain that's what he wanted. And, but that's not what was happening. You know, we cannot live our life only out of a promise book. We cannot just be a favorite word people. We must embrace the whole counsel of God's word. You know... When Paul and Barnabas were on their missionary journey and went to Lystra, do you know that, that the people there were so impressed because a man got healed? And when they saw this man healed, oh my goodness, the people of Lystra said, Whoo, Paul and Barnabas, you're gods. <clears throat> they said, Barnabas is Zeus. And Paul must be Hermes. I, he, you're gods. And they wanted to do sacrifice to them. In fact, the priest of the temple of Zeus brought oxen and brought garlands. And they said, oh, we're going to, you know, make you our gods. The Bible says it was all that Paul and Barnabas could do to restrain the people from sacrificing to them. Well, while they were there at Lystra, and all these people were thinking that Paul was a god. Paul and Barnabas were gods. Some Jews came from Iconium and they came from Antioch. And they saw what was going on. Look what it says in Acts the 14th chapter and in verse 19. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there and having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul. And they dragged him out of the city supposing him to be dead. They really believed they had killed him. They stoned him. They stoned this guy, okay? Now, I do not know where Barnabas was, okay? <laughs> whoop, whoop, I don't know the guy. <laughs> you know, I don't know where he was. I don't know why they didn't stone him too. But they, 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 you know, they thought, they hit Paul with rocks. This is, the, get the picture in your head. They took rocks. And they hit Paul in the head, in the back, in the ribs, on the arms, on the elbow, on the shin, on the knee, and the feet, the neck, the face. They hit him with rocks until they believed they had killed him. And then they drug him out on a trash pile outside the city. Verse 20, however, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up. What did that nut do? He went back into the city. 
I'm not sure I'd have went back into the city. Maybe he was stumbling around. I don't know. <laughs> but you know, when he got up, I'm going to tell you what, he got up sore and bleeding. He didn't just get up okay. You know, I mean, he got up sore and bleeding and hurt and bruised and maybe ribs broke and teeth broke and, and eyes uh, 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 you know, swollen shut and, and you know, ears cut. And you know, this guy had been stoned to death. Get the picture here. No doubt he's all bloody and hurt and broken, and he goes back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas leave for Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and made many disciples, they came back. What in the world would you want to come back to Lystra for? But not only go back to Lystra, they also went back to Iconium and Antioch, where these other people came from. Why in the world would you do something like that? Because in verse 22 it says that they, had, they were on this mission. They were strengthening the souls of the disciples. And they were exhorting them, encouraging them to continue in the faith, to keep on keeping on. Saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Put that one in your promise box. <laughs> we must. Through many hardships, many tribulations, many difficulties, even if difficult times come, continue in faith. Now they're hearing this from a guy that they saw stoned to death. He got up and got back to the job. And he's telling them, listen, whatever the cost, it might cost at some point. But whatever the cost, the cost is worth it. You know, it's not always all about us. That life cannot be lived just out of a promise book. And if that's our picture of God, no doubt we're going to get so disappointed and disillusioned that the devil will do his best to get us to quit at the first obstacle, the first heat, the first problem, the first test, the first trial, the first difficulty we face in life. Have you ever read in 2 Timothy 3.12 what the apostle wrote to Timothy as the apostle was, was, was moving off the scene? He, was, he was, you know, knew he was going to have his head cut off. The apostle Paul knew. He said, my departure's at hand. I, I'm, you know, I'm about to have my head cut off, Timothy. But let me tell you something. Yes, he said in 1 Timothy 3.12. 3, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly, that's what he said, will suffer persecution. That's what he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. That's the reality of it. I don't want to make too big a point of it, but I think sometimes we don't make enough of a point of it. And you might say, well, well I'm not suffering any persecution. I wonder why. Oh, I'm sorry. That was not for you. That was for, uh, you know... All those folks out there in wherever land. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will go through some difficulty at some time because life demands choices and we cannot always say yes to everything. Neither can God. Not every word of God can be found in a promise book. You know, uh, sometimes God's will costs. And at some point, God's will is going to cost each one of us. But life goes on. And we need to go on with life. That's what Joseph is showing. Life goes on. It's not your last worst problem that you need to get hung up on. Bloom where you're planted and realize that not not every word of God comes from a promise book. At some point, we may be disappointed, hurt, unjustly treated, but we cannot allow those times to convince us to quit. Not everything turns out the way that we want always, nor in the time that we think it should. That does not mean God doesn't care. It doesn't mean God doesn't love us. It doesn't mean that God has quit on us. That's not the story. There are some things we can change, and there are some things we cannot change, and we need to learn to leave those things in God's hands. And trust him. You see, what we do while we wait on God really does make a difference. So this morning we've learned two things from this account of the life of Joseph. We've learned that we should bloom where we're planted. And we've learned that, you know, sometimes um, God 
can give us direction that may not favor our greatest desire. That happens. Seldom do I have someone come to me and tell me that God told me to do this and it's something that they really, really, really don't want to do. More than not, people are always coming to tell me, you know, God told me to do this and it's something they really, 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 really want to do. And, you know, uh, you know sometimes, sometimes I'm thinking God didn't speak to them because, you know, sometimes I know that's not in line with what God would have them do. Sometimes. And, and don't just put God on everything good and the devil on everything bad. Let me ask you a question, just a theological question. Who was it that wanted Jesus to be crucified? Was it the will of God or the will of the devil? It was both of their wills. Both God and the devil wanted Jesus crucified. If all Jesus had have done is just reacted to what the devil wanted and said, no, that's bad, not going to do it. We have to rise above all of those things that at times might cost us to do God's will and embrace what God wants above everything else. Okay? I pray no difficult times come to anyone. That's not the message. But the message is you can trust God even in difficult times. The third thing and the last thing that we're going to look at today that Joseph's life teaches us, in, teaches us in this account is to remember. Remember. <laughs> uh, what in the world does that mean? Well, it just means what it says. Remember. You know, everyone desires to be remembered and many people ought to be remembered for some decent thing they did in which they sacrificed to accomplish. Everyone, everyone does some decent things and everyone should be remembered for something, you know? I mean, uh, don't you want to be remembered? I mean, m m most people do. I want to be remembered for something good. I don't want to remember for anything bad. Uh, you know, I want people to forget all the bad and remember me for all the good. That's what most people, I mean, that's what people want to be remembered for. In this particular situation, Joseph was not remembered. The one thing he asked was, remember me. And, and uh, you know, as soon as the butler got okay, and as soon as he forgot everyone that helped him. He forgot. He conveniently forgot, got on about his life, and was enjoying his life, and he forgot Joseph. He did not remember Joseph. You know, it's important that we not be like that butler. It's important that we do not forget those that God used to help us. It's very important. Thanks can mean more than a person might imagine. There are a lot of people in prisons of life and what they really would like to be is remembered in their difficult times, in their moments, in their hardships, their heartaches. Thanks can mean so much. You know, the one leper that returned to Jesus. You remember Luke 17, Jesus healed 10 lepers. They went off and nine of them forgot that Jesus ever did anything for them. But one returned and gave him thanks. Jesus remarked about that one that he remembered. Luke 23, 42 tells us about the thief that was hanging on the cross beside Jesus who, who believed in Jesus and understood that he was a sinner. He was not like the second thief who, who had animosity and anger, but he really had a, had a repentant heart. And you know what he said to Jesus? Remember me when you come to your kingdom. Don't forget me. You know Jesus is never going to forget you. And I don't think you're going to forget him and all the good things he's done. But sometimes perhaps we might forget others who Jesus used to help us. In the 1990s, I was visiting with my friend, Musa Jaguna, who is from Kenya, East Africa. Dr. Jaguna was telling me about how 
He got saved in the 1950s. A, a missionary from South Africa came and spent some time outside of Nairobi. And Musa's family was very poor. They lived in a mud hut in the graveyard. That's the only place because they had no other place to live. And the graveyard was public property. So they lived in the graveyard. His mother, uh, Musa's mother, uh, worked all day long, worked 12 hours a day for one potato, one sweet potato, and came home and shared that with the eight children. But a man from South Africa came and witnessed to some people there, and they got born again. The man tried to start a church, but there were only two families that had, that had gotten born again. And so after some time of being there, a couple of years, the man went back to South Africa. Musa had never heard from him again. Musa was telling me this story in, in the 90s about what happened in the 50s. And I said to Musa, have you ever thanked that man? He said, no, I... I've, I've never seen him. I, I, I just remember a name. No. I said, Musa, you must go. When he got back to Africa, he got on a plane and went to South Africa. And he found this man. The man was elderly, very late in life, and, you know, uh, was, you know, in a very difficult situation, sitting in his house all by himself alone. And Musa told him, I am that little boy that was in that graveyard outside of Nairobi. That little boy that lived in that poverty situation. And I, I got born again whenever you came and told us about Jesus. What happened to you? The man said, well, I despaired. Because all of my work, only two families ever came to church. Your family and one other family. I just thought surely God must not have called me. So I came back home and I, I just decided that I could do nothing for God. So I've never done anything else. I've basically just been sitting here. Musa began to tell him of the 346 churches that he had birthed and how he had taken the gospel across East Africa and, and had, you know, schools and, and, and all, uh, all the works he has done. Musa said the man just sat there and wept and wept and wept. He said, I never knew. He said, I've lived my life believing I was a failure. Oh, what a little thanks can do. You see, without that man coming from South Africa, where would Musa be? Where would his family be? Where would his father be? Musa's father got born again and then died. It's so important to remember. Today, I'm going to ask you to do a couple of things. I'm going to ask you to commit to blooming where you're planted. You can't choose what you go through, but you can choose how to go through it. A second thing I'm going to ask you to do is, is to, uh, you know, realize that not, you know, don't discard words from God that may lead you through some moments of personal cost. Don't only live out of a promise book. And then number three this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. This week, and I'm going to ask you to do it as a lifestyle, but this week particularly, I'm going to ask you to do your best to remember someone who God used to encourage you or to bless you or to do something for you. You know, and if at all possible, I'm going to ask you to just in some way this week, thank them in some small way. Card, letter, phone call, visit, email, text, whatever. Okay? And just thank them. A few years ago, I got a letter from a man that I'd witnessed to in 1977. And when I witnessed to him, he was so ugly to me. And he was ugly to me every day. We lived in apartments next to one another. And he would talk bad about me out loud to other people when I was walking into my apartment because of my witness. Last name was Weiss. Remember him, honey? 
But just a few years ago, he found me and wrote me a letter and told me how he'd gotten born again and how no matter how much he had disliked me, how much he had hated me, how much he had shown his you know, um, uh, anger or, or whatever, his, his disagreement, that he never was able to get away from the seeds that I planted in his life of just being kind and living my witness in front of him. Let me tell you, you make a difference. But also let me tell you, somebody made a difference in your life. Don't forget. It might be what they need in this moment of time. Won't you stand to your feet? I want to thank all of you who are joining us by church online. I hope these words make a difference in your life. You know, just because you're not sitting here does not mean the word's not reaching you with its full impact. Okay? Bloom where you're planted. Don't just live life out of a promise box. And remember those God has used to bless you. Amen. Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace to us, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would rain down your goodness upon us, Lord, and put people on our hearts, sir, that we need to be kind to, Lord. Give us opportunities, Lord, and then give us also the care, the common care that we can stop and spend time, Lord. Just nothing says I care like time, Lord. And help us, Father, to remember those that you have used to bless us. In Jesus' name.